Right on. So we were talking a bit about uh, where, where did you guys want to start today? Um, anything in particular? No. I do have a list. Um, the order in which we proceed is is a bit open. Um, one thing I think uh, would be top of mind is the the monorepo updates. I got a, an update from Joe on that. Uh, he said by the end of the week you should have a demo for the monorepo, which is awesome. Um, the mono repo was uh, done as part of our RFC process, and I thought that this was a really great outcome from the Detroit uh, 2022 Spinnaker Summit. Um, so, I don't know, Denise, do you want to talk to any of that? Uh, the idea of the mono repo or motivations? And... Well, I'm happy to as well. Yeah, exactly. It's, all, it's only in our state, but the, uh, my goal is to really just make sure that the whole is react. Uh, and as you said, Joe, we were we were shooting for trying to get it ready before this happened. Uh, but we should be done by the end of the week. Uh, the demo is turned into. Um, there have been some sort of challenges, uh, but we're, we're addressing that too. Some things to do with some of the older uh, things. Um, things like Keel still being in there, and it's going to happen with that long term. Uh, but some interesting questions and concerns. Uh, but I think it should be great once we can do it. We're, we use it now uh, internally, so that's it matches our whole process. There's going to be questions, of course, about how we migrate from the existing uh, to the new and the steps to do that. And that's really what the demo is about, is showing you know, we are in that conversation of how we make the journey to actually make this a good thing. And then that gives us a tool um, to move forward. Yeah, so I think it's going to reduce friction and improve quality. So in our daily lives, internally, we're looking forward to switching to this. Uh, yeah, I think having it, having it happen uh, open source is going to be kind of the kick in the butt we need to do it. Uh, so yeah, I really look forward to it. I'm happy to work with Joe or whoever. So I can understand all the polish that is made while working. And just, just for some context for those who don't know, Spinnaker is made up of a bunch of different microservices. So currently um, there's, I don't know, 10, 10 or 11 microservices, and then there's a shared library called Quark. Any update that happens to Quark gets uh, uh, propagated to each of the other repos. Um, and then there's some of those other repositories like Orca or Fiat, that when they have updates, they in turn uh, have more pull requests to other repos to update their libraries. Um, this is a very complex uh, uh, And by having a model repo, you'll have one pull request that would change the common library, as well as update all of those other microservices to make sure they're in line and up to date. This is going to really help with testing and making sure we're reducing breaking changes. Um, I, I've been there myself where you have a, a previous, an older release that you need to make a change to uh, the, the common library. And that change is just a, just a lot of work. Um, Dave has done some great work in automating uh, the, the backporting <laughs> changes for, for Quark to, to take that whole load off our plates. Um, but this model repo work is really going to just help with build in. Um, and reviewing changes as well. So we'll be able to see, hey, given this new feature, what are all the changes and all the services that are that are needed? Maybe that does. Yeah, that moves us to the next topic then, which is the automated testing topic. Right, right now, I mean, each each repo has its own automated test, but they only go as far as they go. You know, we build Docker containers or Docker images, I should say, uh, in each repo. But no, nothing ever, none of the automated processes ever actually spin up those containers, uh, spin up those images into containers and make sure they work, much less spinning them all up and make sure they work together. Uh, so that's a gap that um, it sounds like we're trying to fill. There are some UI testing efforts and some, and some more back-end focused testing efforts. Uh, and I guess that was the next topic, is to, to see where people are with that and to try to make sure we're aligned and to coordinate, um, I think, I think the goal is to have a GitHub action that you know, happens in pull requests and, and spins up the just built image and, and tries it out. Some things are going to be easier 
with the monorepo. I kind of hesitate to say that we're waiting for the monorepo because I don't really want to slow anything down if anybody's got some testing stuff. We'd love to have it, it would help validate the monorepo. So, like I said, all, you know, full steam ahead to follow up, but we probably do need to align on like, what does it mean to spin up these Docker, uh, Docker units and, you know, get it, you sort of quickly get into like installation. How do you install spinning for conversations? I mean, it can inspire a lot of control, but it can also be um, super helpful to, to make this stuff happen. Uh, on that topic, we have been working to kind of um, come up with a test plan. Um, operation to say that this is the you know, testing we've done, the way we've done. Uh, we are going to open source our uh, pipeline uh, builder tool as well uh, as part of the effort. Um, we, yeah, I am just trying to make sure that I can run the dates and all these things that happen. Um, the plan that's in place looks good enough to share. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. We haven't actually made right. it public yet. Yeah. It's a uh, recent final stages. So essentially, the thinking is that you know, the magic of this, uh, you should be able to take it off uh, with GitHub uh, actions, bring up the instance of the spinnaker, and plug some touch with it. And it's uh, quite meant to do it. And they fly up the, the smoke has gone. And then scaling. Great. I've done builders in Java, so that was part of the motivation too, so that there's only people to be familiar with it when they kind of do this. Great. So the mono repo probably is not as critical, right? So you, you should be able to replace it once mono repo comes to you. Know, start with the, the so then we're there aren't any nightly builds. It sounds scary to say. There aren't any nightly builds right now. There used to be in the old system. Um, what, which Git repo do you figure is going to host the? Until we have the monorepo, where do you figure the nightly builds are going to live? Because um, that's one thing we need to figure out. Right now we're doing the builds, right? But it will be fine. So if you want to make that, make you do it if you want. Right. Okay. okay. So that's the build tool, I guess, is the place that's doing. They're, that's doing the like, ad hoc. We're actually doing the releases. Uh, that's what that happens. Okay. We want to scan it. Yeah. Sounds good. We have a new a new guest. There a lot. Hi, good guys. Hi. We're yeah. having a platform signal. It's pretty informal. All right. Yeah. Uh, we'll just uh, touch you guys a little bit. Yeah. Um, we were just talking about some improvements we're making to a repo structure and to some automated testing. How can you, and we're all actually on the TLC of Spinnaker, so we, we may have each other, but can you tell us like, what's your interaction with Spinnaker like these days? Sure. Um, <laughs> hi, guys. Um, so I joined at Adobe about 10 years ago. Now became manager of my SRE team. And uh, we are trying to create new pipelines for very old uh, locations that we have. Um, the application right now is called Connect. It's kind of a platform. It's, it's similar to Zoom. Um, however, we're trying to build the next, you know, CD for this, and we are considering Spinnaker a lot. So, in fact, we're running a PLC right now, and it brought few requests from my team. Um, and uh, we're trying to understand if you can actually fit into a product, if you can automate. It's mainly actually a window shop, even. We're moving to Linux on so a new platform. But it's going to take years to get there. Um, so I want to try to understand more. You know how Spinnaker is evolving. Um, one of the biggest concerns they have is the uh, community out there. And the, you know, face issue is really complicated sometimes to find an answer um, to it. So it's uh, it's my first question. Where does your stuff run? Is it running? Yeah, in Azure. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's all in AWS now. We left Azure. Good to know. Mm -hmm. It already has a team that's using Spinnaker. It does have one, and uh, from I've heard from one of our engineers that they're moving away. Apparently, because now they develop a platform that's called Ethos, 
and the field with R integration. So there is that kind of an idea. We can't because I don't really want to turn it up too much more. Because it's one, which is all Windows. There's a lot of level commentary things here. So, so the pipeline is yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so uh, we do a lot of Jenkins um, automation, but we think in the long run that would be very complicated to you know, orchestrate a large pipeline using Jenkins. So we, we need this kind of orchestration layer on top of it. And it seems like Spring Up is the right way to go. Oh, it sounds on. better. So, have you already done it? You see it just it, it, it's a uh, phase one now. They're deploying and trying to create new staging environments to it. Yeah. And it's then we the first, you know, first step of proof being deployment with it, um, and that's where we are right now on the stage. So does it work well for you guys? Is is a is a the future? How is it? How is it looking in a year or two from now? Um, for us, it works great. Um, <laughs> but you know, my company has done a lot of this. We have a lot of different options. Uh -huh. My team, we are sort of here to help us. And. Um, Lights on and keep shipping, keep shipping uh, versions of software. Uh, and I know for me, like, I, I already invest a lot of time in Spinnaker, and it's hard, to, it's hard to invest more. So I, I kind of resist resist helping out on Slack sometimes. Sometimes I help. I don't know. It's it's a challenge. Uh, I mean, this one that we talked about in one of, the, in one of the keynotes this morning is like, well, how do you how do you build a community? How do you get people doing stuff? And, and yeah, pull requests are not the only way to contribute for sure. Like, Helping out on Slack, helping out with community support issues. Is it usually? Yeah. Forums. Yeah. Yeah. It's perfect. Yeah, we have like GitHub issues and Slack. I think those are those are the two places. So at least it's a little bit focused. Yeah. Um, it's still pretty. Well, um, oh, it's, it's like a good challenge. Yeah, I think part of that too is it's, you have this barrier of entry or this, this really high bar of entry for Spring. Um, and one of the things that the TSC is trying to do is lower that bar of entry. Um, there are some efforts going on with the customize and some of the to set up Spinnaker. And I think doing those things, putting it in the channel, you know, having the technical oversight team kind of guide some of that and some of that in a way that is more engaging for people that might help us build a better team. Um, it's definitely going to be a process, right? It's not going to be something that just kind of happens naturally overnight. Um, Spinnaker has a lot of tech debt, and that's also the other thing that we are having a roadmap is kind of getting tech debt, um, which will also help draw in people to do, you know, more um, contributions, because, you know, if you're using the newest 
think Lamar more actually did. Um, so as those things happen, if you can keep momentum, at least even in this group, I think you will see that improvement because it will make things easier for you to contribute, it will make things make it easier to use, that's more about you. Super complicated, and you have all the people who understand it and support it, and and help you each other, right? But if we decrease the fact that if we lower our entry so that more people have the knowledge, and you'll see more people responding because it comes very cool off now. And so that's the work one, you know, that we're trying to get to pack that and then move forward. Now, all of us are, are still contributing things. Um, there's still like our students for like CDNs. There's um, my team. Uh, we did a few hours for account management on a few of the database. Um, you know, everybody's had some efforts that they are working on and contributing. Um, so, so, yeah, these guys are here. Which is, they, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, that helps, right? Because it's more engaging. There's uh, things that you can do and it didn't extend. But the nature of the fact that it was deployed to everything, um, I think ultimately will keep it around um, going going off of that too, I think the, the we were talking about integration end to end testing uh, right before this, and I, I think uh, by having that in place, it'll make contributors more confident in making changes because there's it's pretty daunting when you make a change in one repo and you have to look at other repos to identify hey, did this work out well. Uh, and having having uh, good tests in place and making that transparent as well, so that members of the community can can see, hey, what what happened? Why did this test fail? Or I'm having this issue. Can now can I write a test to exercise that to make sure we don't have that regression in the future? So that type of participation is going to be really key, I think, in the community because everyone has very very familiar reasons that occur. I'm sure that we've all seen. And just as talking with each other, you know, um, people use it in very, very different ways. But it's, it is flexible enough to do that. And by having the, the different types of um, tests or workflows as part of that integration testing suite, I think will be great. You just reminded me of something. So, one of the things that we like people to do when they submit a code change, they're like, hey, this is broken, I want to fix it. Or, you know, Maybe I just like keep saying this, and I'm the annoying guy that keeps saying it. But it's like, well, where's the test? Like, write a test that fails, an automated test that fails, and then you fix it, and then that test starts to pass. It's like test-driven development. People don't even talk about it anymore because it's like the way the way people work. But the, what Cameron just pointed out is that sometimes, like some little detail, like Java level super bits and bytes code code test is not is not the test that people care about. What people care about is like this pipeline used to fail, and if people could, you know, lots of people. I th it's like more people will sort of know about pipelines probably than like intricacies of some you know crazy JDM detail. And so to be able to submit a pipeline that fails is also another way to open open things up to contributions. One other thing I wanted to say about like uh, I don't know how to decide to use Spinnaker or not to use Spinnaker. One of the knocks I think on Spinnaker over the years is that it has been that it's expensive to operate. Uh, and it, I don't know, it's definitely getting less expensive. Uh, I'm going to give a talk tomorrow that has some has some big numbers in it about, about how much less expensive it's getting. But I, I work at Salesforce and we have pretty pretty massive scale and we spend a lot of money on Spinnaker and people want us to spend a lot less money on Spinnaker. So we, I mean, I, I have a whole team, my team and cousin teams and sibling teams and you know, I don't know, hundred, hundreds is maybe slightly overstating it, but not that much. Lots of people are very focused on making Spinnaker more efficient. So if if that's like the urban myth that that Spinnaker is very expensive to operate. Um, I think we're going to get past that. Yeah. So that's the advantage. So they have been using it at a very large scale. Uh, um, so with Spinnaker, it's a, uh, that's a reliability kind of thing. It has the mileage in the field deploying to different environments. Um, the cost is being addressed, but you get that reliability with the money. Yeah. But it's good to know it's stable and it's out there and working well. Yeah. Yeah. Salesforce is Good. Yeah. Yeah. Would you say expensive? Is it operational? Right. Uh, I will watch your presentation. I'm just curious. I mean, I, yeah, there, I guess there are lots of different dimensions to that. There, there's human cost to it, but I'm really talking about computing resources. If, if you, if you, 
it sort of depends how many places you're asking Spinnaker to deploy to. If you're only asking it to deploy to, let's say, one AWS account, and that's an AWS account that doesn't have very many auto scanning groups or security groups or images or any of the any of the you know, AWS resources, if there aren't that many, then Spinnaker doesn't have to work that hard to understand what's going on there. But if there are 10,000 accounts and each of them have thousands of those you know, AWS objects, Spinnaker works very hard to, to keep track of them all. Uh, and, and sometimes it doesn't necessarily do it in the most efficient way. And, and when it doesn't, you know, people get woken up at night where I work and I don't even have to figure it out. <laughs> So we're getting there, and, and uh, it, it is, these issues are sort of, in Spinnaker terms, what we say cloud provider specific, so the, the code that handles that for AWS accounts is different than the code that handles it for Kubernetes accounts and for all the other different kinds of cloud providers. So if, some, if there's a, you know, a specific thing that's inefficient, we can home in on that thing and, and fix it. Uh, Just regular perception, right? And so um, it, the resource driven side of that is Spinnaker just checking to see if everything is in place that it's supposed to be. And they're really they're checking all the things um, that could be expensive. And the more things you have to check, the more expensive things are. There are other ways to attack that, and that goes back to like, this group and the conversation I was having before we even started the meeting. Companies, these companies here, like Adobe, you know, Salesforce, Apple, you know, taking what it takes, let's sit down and talk about what's important to us, what efficiencies are important to us, and that gives us the direction to the attack. And then it also helps, you know, Cameron and Google, their vendors, and say, hey, you know, if you, this thing works, then you can install our stuff. Um, and, you know, we should be trying to conversation with that man. Um, but my team also, the bug against Spinnaker, and the difference is they're just they're taking about a month. Um, and we write code, we write some of the code for the internal version of Spinnaker for all something, and we also run the instances of it, but we write code along with the things that we want to be more efficient, yeah. so that we can keep our team small, so that's all the main jars that come there, There's nothing I can do about the cost of these files now, where it's like, okay, to manage all of the things, yeah, I think the Spinnaker does two things, right? One is the deployment, and also keeps track of what's currently running in the target environment. So as an operation, you can come in and then say, what is the status of my deployment in this cluster currently? And so that, that's part of where it does the periodic refresh of what's currently running the target environment, it stores all it in memory. So that's the cost of the these talking about. You have a large number of these clusters that you have to form to. And the, depending on the number of resources of these clusters, you grow the uh, thing. But uh, he's going to talk tomorrow uh, on yeah. some of the efficiencies that we brought. Yeah, and the pipeline complexity issue too. Yeah. Um, that we are all the super, super Uh, is a Actually, I, I, uh, I mean, I want this to be a positive comment. So I may not have my words organized to make it that way, but what, what ends up happening? I think it happened at Salesforce. It started before I got there, um, and you guys probably see it in a bunch of your customers that you know the POC happens and somebody makes a pipeline or makes 10 pipelines. And if you're lucky, right, everybody gets the green light, things go forward, people get very excited, but you've still got these pipelines, and like, now somebody's gonna come up with like an abstraction layer, or a team's gonna build pipelines for other teams and, and help that, but these original pipelines are probably still around, and they probably have to keep working, and sometimes you wish you could change them, and anyway, pipelines get complicated, even with the best intentions in the world, and uh, anyway, this can be a this can be a hard problem. You know, there are blue green deployments and you know inception things about Spinnaker upgrading Spinnaker, and and these are all the like classic CD problems that we feel like we're good at solving. And we know how to talk about, but like change somebody's pipelines and people start to get hurt feelings. 
you know, and they can be hard to change. Sorry, do you mind using the mic? Oh, sorry. Thanks. Uh, it, it, the short of what I'm just saying is that uh, it gets complicated, right? Because you can have pipelines that call pipelines. You can accidentally create um, loops, and if you're passing contacts with those loops, you lose the memory. Uh, and at some point, you just run out of memory. Um, you know, the failure itself will propagate quickly because what happens is the orchestrators are unaware that you've created this problem. And then the next orchestrators will just try to pick up the tasks that are still there, not realizing that it's actually you know, too much memory. Um, so that's the catastrophic problem that is always in the back of my mind as someone who manages instances. And finding ways to one track what's going on, quickly you know, recognize that and rip those out of time. Um, but you can also teach and train. And so we've worked with the team who have the most complex pipelines and say, hey, these are the ones, this is the way to handle these problems. Talk to us about the patient manager, we can tell you what's going on. And there's also ways not to have the pipelines too. Uh, yeah. How, how do you work around those limitations? Do you come with the benchmark as you go progress? Um, we have so many monitors in place. Um, it is, yeah, we do a lot of monitors. We see that in the actions. Also, in your organization, are you going to be the central team that provides the tools to the software teams and the developer, different groups that use them? Yeah, yeah. We're going to kind of, uh, yeah, we're going to define the path, and from there, uh, we're going to try to get into the engineering developers to come along with the uh, CI um, portion of it. Um, but yeah, our team is going to be kind of the core to make that happen. And now we're just going to cherry pick up technologies, which ones speak each one. And, and it's kind of hard because there's so many out there. And you know, you do a PLC, all right, but you know, you're going to go the whole year and not do it for it. So uh, we kind of centralize on aim and spin So. Um, I'm still some pushbacks from the engineers, but I'm sure you have to sit with them and understand what they are. Um, but one of the things I also they asked is like, do we have any training? Is there any training alignments? Is, is there a place you go and take a class? Um, I know that um, our money provides training. I think does Optimize provide training as well? And, yeah, we provide training on a uh, new basis. So yeah. we don't actually. Have there regular training sessions going on? Um, but if there is a need, then we may pay off some of the vendor and have to do it. And the memory as well, yeah, we provide training. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there are like some blog posts and, and stuff uh, yeah. with, and, 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 and videos, so maybe it depends on the particular topic you're interested in. Um, but yeah, these are good resources, and, and if not, uh, have you found your way to Spinnaker Slack yet? I, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm David Byron. So send me a note on Slack. We'll try to get you connected with, with the right folks. And, and what I've seen is there's there's different trainings for different folks, right? There's you, you all would need operating Spinnaker training, and then your developers need to know how to use use Spinnaker itself, and that that's an important um, piece of that of that puzzle too. Um, This is a very insightful thing here. Where, where are you based, by the way? In San Francisco. Oh, great. Cool. Yeah. You guys are there? Almost, almost all of us. Yeah. I'm in San Diego. Yeah. You're here? Oh, thank you, Mother. Okay. All right. Cam's in San Diego these days. San Diego. The Army, I guess, is technically based in there. Yeah, we're yeah. in the, the Bay. Yeah. 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 So you guys are also in the Army. I live in yeah. Berkeley. I, I'm in the East Bay, San Diego. Yeah, I, I'm in Berkeley. It's just the office of San Right. All right. Is there a drink? Perfect. That's good. All right. <laughs>
Yeah, I, I know that there's meetups on occasion in the Bay Area too. So if you guys are ever around, um, I don't I don't know if there's DevOps specific ones. I think there there used to be pre-COVID, but it's it's been a while. Um, I know in San Diego we are trying to revive the meetup community. It's been relatively successful. So it's been, um, but meetups are kind of a, a cool way of, of getting getting the word out there. Yeah, I was just, I don't know if this is going to end up being a rant or helpful, but like, I, I think in some ways what I wish there were were like best practices documents out there and people could say, oh, this is how you write a pipeline, or this is how you don't write a pipeline, and these are the things to think about, and, and we maybe don't have as many of those as we wish. Um, and I think I end up spending more of my time on the implementation side, I don't know, maybe making it harder to make mistakes so that like, you sort of can do whatever you want, or at least try whatever you want, and Spinnaker will tell you when you're doing something that doesn't work. I feel like we may have some uh, slightly deep waters to walk in about, like adjusting the way Spinnaker does authentication to make rate limiting easier, and and to make like I don't know quotas for the various ways that Spinnaker slices and dices this work so that you know noisy neighbors and denial of service and things. And maybe these are all the things that Salesforce cares about, and if you have smaller instances of Spinnaker or make more dedicated instances of Spinnaker you don't have to care about. Um, we, we do wish we had better rate limiting. Uh, and then the kind of thing like, and you know, more open source uh, dashboards and alerts. And we actually have a reasonable progress at that. Um, so you're not, you won't be starting from scratch. Um, but it's not as easy as I, would, as I wish it were. Yeah, the dashboards, uh, it's a lot better than the page. You do get a good sense of the operational instances. How old is Spinnaker right now? Yeah, Spinnaker came out in 2015. Um, as a, it, was open, it was an internal project at Netflix during that time, and it was an open source leader. I believe it was that same year um, after Google joined the project. Um, I think some of the commits go back that far, though. Yeah, the, the, the Git history goes back. Yeah, so it's a pretty mature product, and one thing that's really interesting is um, there's, you know, companies are large, and they have a lot of footprint. Not everyone is Kubernetes only. Um, as much as maybe people might, might like that idea, there's there's industry trends that are, are pointing that you know, Kubernetes only is not necessarily the, the right way to go. Um, and Spinnaker's been around before Kubernetes, and it it's, works great with Kubernetes, but it also works great with not Kubernetes too. So if, you, if you're a large organization, um, or maybe you acquire a company or something, and you have to onboard them onto your, your DevOps platform, if, if they're not on Kubernetes, you know, that's going to be a challenge. Um, and then now you're trying to integrate them while moving them to Kubernetes, and that's just kind of a pain. So it's, it, if, if you're able to meet your, your customers, who in this case are your developers, meet them where they're at, you can allow them to use the right tools for the job. Essentially. I forgot how long we're supposed to go. It's 10 past 12. This goes to 12 30. 20, 20 minutes. Okay. I had till 12. Yeah. Wait oh, until 12? Oh. 11 30 to 12. Should it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this has been a great a great conversation. Uh, thank you all for, for joining today. Um, any, any closing remarks that anyone would like to make? I mean, it's on the schedule, so I think we need to show up at least and yeah. see, uh, see who's here. Yeah. I mean, I think Matt came up with some interesting Kubernetes stuff. But it's another place where like, we'd like to build some momentum. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see each other. I think for as much as this might have felt like it was in the weeds, that has a that has a risk of getting even further in the weeds and like very, very specific details of how Spinnaker works and how Spinnaker you know operates with Kubernetes. But um, you know, in the end of it all these are the things that matter. And something doesn't work. So this the objects that we want to get in there, get our hands dirty and fix it. But it could be interesting to see. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so join us later today at the Cloud SIG. Um, I guess if you're watching the recording, uh, expect that video online as well.
Thanks very much. Catch you all later. Great. Last week, you guys, thanks for, for clarifying, taking this session to answer my questions. Yeah, it was helpful. I was you Yeah, yeah. Um, we were going to have Mike today, but he got an accident, so, well, a car accident, so uh, he's. Uh, but I'm familiar with that part because yeah. Adobe created this ethos platform, which is kind of a you know hybrid mix of management provider, AWS, and so on. And again, when you have all this standardized, all the teams unload their, their apps. Mm -hmm. So, but it's very kind of locked down. Like, you know, you, you're going to use all because you don't want to So. It's good for the whole company, but something that you can use and you can update, so it's, which is our case with the legacy product. So you guys, uh, uh, I hope you understand the real or kind of queue. Oh, oh, so we're the Department of Technical Oversight. Uh, so um, we formed about a year ago, uh, a little bit less than a year ago. Lots and lots of contributors in the community and all the people who work for all these companies. I don't think too many people are writing lots of people who work for all the contributors who spend their career on this all together. Yeah. There's not many people writing something you're going to have to find. Yeah, they're not doing like whatever smart house projects are doing. It's not really for that. It is a large scale. It is a large scale. Yeah. 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 Y
Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, that's right.